Well, we are in Genesis in the last session, and I deliberately left chapter 49 out of the series because I wanted chapter 49, which is the next to last chapter. Remember last time we went all the way through to 50, but we skipped 49. You'll see why I did that. It's a different kind of a wrap-up for this book. But it's been, uh, the book of Genesis, in my mind, is one of, the, one of our most exciting studies. And I really had a great time, even though I've been through it several, obviously, many times before. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly been fun for me. I hope it's been encouraging to you. But one of the things that we're going to, uh, I'd like you to be thinking about is uh, as you reflect on the book, you're finishing tonight, you'll be looking through your notes. You might re-skim your notes in the book and just try to find how many places the book po focuses specifically on Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to uh, see a lot of that tonight. So we're going to look at the tribes prophetically. This is, uh, this is one of the great expressions of destiny. Here's Jacob, the patriarch of the 12 tribes. He's on his deathbed. He calls his sons there, uh, uh, and one at a time, he prophesies over each one. He sort of gives them a report card, but the prophecies are often a bit cryptic. There's Hebrew wordplay going on. Some of it's quite mystical. Some of it's quite clear and quite startling. Some of it is still a, a challenge to many scholars as to what's going on here. But uh, we're going to do something in addition to that, because when you go through your Bible from Genesis to the end of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, many of you were with us in our Deuteronomy study, but I'll assume some of you haven't been. Deuteronomy is sort of to the Torah what Paul's epistles are to the New Testament. Because the book of Deuteronomy is actually three sermons by Moses at the end of his life. But when you get to chapter 33 in Deuteronomy, Moses does something very parallel to what Jacob does. He comments on each of the 12 tribes, all but one. He omits one. We'll come to that. But um, so we're, I'm going to put in, if you can sort of imagine it in parallel, as we go through chapter 49, we're going to also take a look at Deuteronomy 33. They, they latch up. So it, it may be, because what we're going for here is not just chapter 49, but a perspective of the 12 tribes in advance. Bear in mind, this is, they're just sons around Jacob's bed, but they're going to be the primary tribes in the history of Israel all the way through to the book of Revelation. So chapter 49, here we go. Now the patriarchs, to refresh your memory, remember Abraham um, uh, had uh, under uh, uh, Sarah Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah, through which he has two. Uh, uh, just as uh, 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 Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, Isaac has Esau and Jacob. But God, God intervenes and, and establishes his line. Jacob has two wives, Leah and Rachel. And uh, Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah in series. This got Rachel pretty upset because she was barren at this point. So she indulged in what was common practice in that culture. Uh, and that's to give her handmaid as a surrogate mother, if you will. And so she gives Bilhah, which had been given to her as a handmaid, to uh, Jacob as a surrogate wife. And through Bilhah, she has two children, Dan and Naphtali. And uh, Leah figures, gee, that worked out pretty well for her. Why can't I do that? So she gets Zilpah, her handmaid, to Jacob. Jacob's probably getting exhausted. But anyway, we have Gad <laughs> and Asher, okay? And uh, by this time, though, fortunately, J Rachel, uh, uh, Rachel has a child, Joseph. And Joseph is very favored by Jacob because he's the son of the wife that he loved the most. He was very conspicuous in his passion for Rachel. They really loved each other. There's a strange myth going around that Rachel didn't really love Jacob. I don't know where that came from. The Bible clearly says that she, she loved Jacob. So anyway, uh, anyway, we, we dealt with that before. Uh, and of course, uh, meanwhile, Leah gets bar uh, is no, uh, starts having some more. She has Issachar and Zebulun. And uh, later on... Uh, uh, Rachel will give birth to Benjamin, but she die, dies in childbirth. So uh, uh, Benjamin's the, young, the youngest of the bunch. But you understand why Joseph was favored in Joseph's eyes, because he was the firstborn of his favorite wife. And that's what all the other guys resent. One of the things you can be sensitive as you study your Bible, and we talk about these different tribes, recognize that they didn't all feel like brothers. The ones that had a common mother were felt closer in bond than the ones that were 
uh, of, a, of another wife of, jo of Jacob's. So I understand there are really clusters within the family uh, thing here, and there's probably some tensions that, that need to be sensitive to. Uh, and also, you'll notice when they're listed in various places, they're listed 20 times in the Bible, that the, very often they're in chronological order. Sometimes they're the, the wives and then the concubines. They sometimes call the Zilpah and Bilhah concubines, and I won't get into that technicalities the, at this point. But that's just by way of review. Of course, Joseph, Joseph has down in Egypt two ch children, Manasseh and Ephraim, that are get adopted by Jacob as his own. So you need to understand that Manasseh and Ephraim have equal standing as if they were sons of Jacob, even though really what we would call grandsons, because he goes through that procedure. That's what we went through last time. So those are the 12 tribes that we're going to be examining in perspective, uh, prospective, in other words, as in the future, as we sit by Jacob's bed here. Now, these tribes... Also, when we went through them, we make the, the, the names themselves had meaning. Reuben is, is, comes from a root which suggests to behold a son. She was excited because she had her son. Um, Simeon means heard. Levi joined to Judah praise. Judah, some of these are clearer than others. Several of them have several different, mean, pardon me, several different meanings and, uh, uh, as you go through that. Bilhah had Dan and Naphtali, judge and wrestling and so forth. Um, uh, Gad means several things, a troop or fortune. It can be, can, it, see, these are really just root words, if you will. Asher uh, suggests happy. And these inferences are drawn from the text when they're born. So they're not contrived by someone on the sidelines here. And uh, Issachar and Zebulun and uh, so forth. Um, so these are going to be a little more meaningful later, but I wanted to remind you as we went through their births, we talked about each one of these. Let's now take a look at chapter 49, Jacob's final prophecies. Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So he's talking prophetically. These aren't just blessings, just a report card. or It's um, the uh, gather yourself. Every time I think of a, a Jewish father... Um, in bed, dying, family all around. I'm reminded of the time when the eldest son leaned over and says, Father, we've taken care of everything. We've made all the arrangements that you asked for. But there's one thing we forgot to ask you. Did you want to be buried or cremated? And he thought about it a while. He turned to his son and said, Surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just... <laughs> That's so bad, I like it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, anyway. But anyway, here he says, Gather yourselves together and bear ye sons of Jacob and hearken to Israel your father. Let's remember, by the way, that Israel is his name. It's the name of a nation, but it's the... It's always, it, in other words, uh, don't try to make distinctions between Israel and Jews. A lot of the anti-Semitic literature builds these mountains. Um, and I, I, don't, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I just recognize that Israel is not just the northern kingdom, although the northern kingdom adopted the house of Israel as their label, as opposed to the house of Judah in the south. That name Israel refers to the sons of Jacob collectively, all of them. And uh, let's move on. And this is the blessing wherewith, oh, excuse me, um, I'm going to pick up to parallel here the Deuteronomy passage. Just imagine them laying side by side. I put the reference in the lower right in a slightly different color to remind us that we're glimpsing back at Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, chapter 33 is parallel in a sense to, Jer to uh, Genesis 49. Deuteronomy opens up with Moses. This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Now bear in mind, from Genesis' point of view, this is five chapters later, or four chapters later, in other words. At the end of Genesis, at the beginning of the Torah, Deuteronomy at the end of the Torah. And of course, in the days of Moses. So let's try to remember that Moses is speaking, you know, uh, many years ahead. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. And so this is Moses closing the Torah, if you will, in the final chapters of the final book of the Torah. He says, Yea, he loved the people, speaking of God, Yea, he loved the people, all the saints are in thine, thy hand. They sat down at thy feet, every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. For he was king in Jeshurun, 
when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Here's a word you don't see very often, maybe three times in the Bible, but it's, a, it's like a pet name for Israel. And there's a big, there's a whole Hebrew wordplay going on here. It, it really is tend to suggest the, the dear, upright people. You'll find it in Deuteronomy 32 as well as here uh, in 33, and you'll find it in Isaiah 44. Um, and I won't get into all the wordplay, uh, but the Septuagint translates it, the beloved one, using agapeo. It's actually using the perfect participle, participle passive of the Greek, agapeo, for the label. But it's a, it's an, it's a term of endearment. We don't have to uh, go further than that. It's just a, a, it wouldn't be, as you're reading your Bible, it might throw you, what's this all about? It's just a, a term of endearment for Israel that you find occasionally used. When the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Getting back to Jacob now. He starts with Reuben. He's the firstborn, right? Reuben, thou art my firstborn, Jacob says, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Well, he heaps praise upon Reuben, which of course collapses because of Reuben's conduct with Jacob's concubine, which was more than just a sex act, by the way. Many commentators, uh, you know, comment that in the, in the spirit that, okay, this young guy, you know, went to bed with one of Jacob's concubines. Uh, and uh, it's actually more than that because that was also a gesture of power grabbing. It was his attempt to uh, excel within the family. He's sort of exercising what he felt was a right because he's the firstborn. He's the heir apparent, presumably. And so it's a, it's a faux pas, not only sexu sexually inappropriate, but it's also a huge, huge breach of, of character and, 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 and order here. So Jacob starts off with him, you were my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. In other words, he could have had it all. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, and thou de th then defiledest thou it. He went up to my couch. So that's, that pretty well nails it. Now in Deuteronomy, Moses says the equivalent thing. Let Reuben live and not die. Let not his men be few. Now, whether it says, it actually says, the Hebrew says, let his men be few, but it's the context of the passage where you have to infer the not. And what this is actually intended to be in Moses' day is a, a, a label of encouragement. Because by then, Reuben was sort of on the sidelines, and, and, and Moses is in effect saying, let not, let not his men be few. He's, he's, going to, he's going to prosper. Not like he might have you know, from the context of Jacob, you follow me. But it's, uh, it's intended pretty much to be uh, a, 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 a word of encouragement to him. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> see, J Jacob indicated that he would not excel, but Moses is in effect encouraging him that... Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's not going to be lost in the, in, in, the, in the numbers. In fact, he will not be as numerous as the others later on in the censuses, uh, and, uh, he, nor was he ever distinguished in the, census, in the uh, enterprise of his, the members of that tribe. And so uh, he uh, didn't have any uh, elevation within the management of the, 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 the nation. So summarizing, he was the firstborn of Jacob by Leah. His name is connected with the phrase, the Lord has looked upon my affliction, because that was their first, so she, was, she was upset about not having ch children until then. His incestuous act with Bilhah, of course, was highly inappropriate. And it was Reuben who advised his brothers not to kill Joseph and return to the pit to release him. That's to his credit, obviously. He came back and was shocked, of course. Uh, and Reuben's uh, forfeited his birthright given to Joseph, Joseph he, the, and the tribe of Reuben was involved in the rebellion in the wilderness back in number, in number 16. You notice how often God seems to assert his sovereignty by bypassing the firstborn. He sets up the basic order. The firstborn has got the double portion. He's the priest of the family. He's got all these neat things. But then with Seth uh, and Cain, we have that, of course, bypass for obvious reasons there. Um, Shem and Japheth. Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Judah and Joseph both over Reuben. We'll come back to that in a minute. Moses over Aaron. Aaron was his older brother, remember? And David, of course, ahead of all his brothers. So God has, if nothing else, it's God putting his fingerprint on what's going on. This is by his... In, in, in. Now notice, the rights of the firstborn that Reuben had went to Joseph. We, I think we're familiar with that. His privileges as a priest of the family will devolve upon Levi. 
and his kingly right to rule will fall upon Judah. So not only has Reuben forfeited, the three things that were his entitlement as firstborn get distributed among the other tribes. And uh, especially the, the, the division between Levi and Judah. You want to keep in mind all through the scripture that the priesthood and the kingly lines were separated. And you could facetiously say this is separation of church and state, but I hate to even make that quip because it will confuse people. There is no ch separation of church and state in our Constitution. That's a contrived uh, uh, ruling by the, by, our, by the adversaries of order. But uh, uh, the, Anyway, Reuben, uh, unstable as thou, thou, shalt, uh, uh, thou shalt not excel at preeminence. The tribe was uh, as not aiming to excel, unfortunately chose a settlement on the other side of the Jordan. Remember that he was, there, were, there were two and a half tribes that chose to stay on the east of the Jordan. Moses said, okay, but you've got to come with us to fight the battle, but once you've conquered the land, you can come back and inherit. And they did do that. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So Reuben's among them that are on the east of the Jordan. Very, very attractive ground in those days, but at the same time also the buffer between them and their enemies. So they're the first always to get captured and so forth. Now, prophecy of Moses back in Deuteronomy said, let not his men be few. The first numbering was 46.5 in Numbers 1, and the second numbering in Numbers 26, they, they declined a little. Most of the others increased. So they didn't disappear, they didn't get really clobbered, but they obviously they, they let not his men be few. In other words, he was able to somewhat hold his own. No judge, no prophet or prince, apparently, is found of that tribe. So they didn't excel. Well, let's go to two others. Uh, Jacob lumps them together, Simeon and Levi. Why do you think he lumped them together? Well, because they joined forces, didn't they, with Dinah and all that. Anyway, Simeon and Levi are brethren. The instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. You can tell this thing, this whole business at Shechem was on his mind. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Well, this is a pretty interesting prophecy because Simeon, can you find the area in the land that's known as Simeon? It gets absorbed. And uh, Levi didn't inherit ground. He, they, he, they inherited 48 cities, remember? Because they were, the Lord was their inheritance. So the, priests, the Levites and the priests, the priests are a subset. Of, not all Levites are priests. To be a priest, you have to be a, a descendant of Aaron, right? So, uh, but anyway, it's interesting that in two separate ways they were scattered, or, or so forth. And of Levi, he said, let thy Thummim and Urim be with thy Holy One. Who, now, oh, excuse me, by the way, I, 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 we switched to Deuteronomy here. This is Moses speaking, because by then this has all been ordained. Of Levi, he said, let thy Thummim and Urim be with thy Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him. Neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments. These are the teachers, right? The Levites are teachers. Were their teach that was their role in the community. They were the teachers. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee and the whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. Bless, Lord, his substance and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him and of them that hate him, that they rise not again. It's interesting how the Levites, yes, they participated with Simeon in that cruelty over Dinah and all that, but they also are jealous of the Lord's sanctity. They were the ones that stood with Moses in the big showdown as in the Exodus. And that's one reason they're rewarded with the priesthood as, as their, their role in the community. And uh, they were, they, don't assume that these guys are namby-pamby guys. These are a rough bunch of guys, tough guys. The name is linked with the root meaning to join. That's going to be important later. I'm sure, going to show you something. Uh, he, they, avenged, they were involved in that vengeance over the seduction of Dinah that we talked about. They did express intrinsic zeal against idolatry, and that's why they got appointed as the priests. That was in Exodus 32 and so forth. They were exempt, because they were the priests, they were exempt from enrollment in military duty. That's why they're not in the marching order. So you always have 12 tribes, whether or not they're marching. If they're marching, you don't have Levi, but they split Joseph into two to get 12. There's always 12 tribes, whether or not you include one. So you have to understand the, how they play that game. Um, and of course, the... Uh, 
they're subordinate to the sons of Aaron, which is, of course, in other words, the sons of Aaron were the priests. They were the senior ones, teachers of the law through that, and they were also judges. And they guarded the king's person in the house in times of danger. So this is like the Praetorian, the Jewish equivalent of the Praetorian guard, probably. Now, Simeon, second son of Jacob by Leah, he also was associated with Levi in that vengeance against Hamor and the Shechemites. Uh, he, Simeon was the one that Joseph had detained uh, in Egypt as a hostage, if you recall. So uh, he, he, he got a little extra. <laughs> His, Benjamin got a little extra in the positive sense. Simeon got a little extra in the negative sense. And uh, it's interesting that uh, his father, when dying, pronounced a malediction against him to be divided and scattered. It's interesting when you compare the numbering in Numbers 1 and Numbers 26 that Simeon decreased by two-thirds in the watering of the wilderness. And uh, uh, so he dwindled a number and ultimately sank into insignificance. I'm always amused when people want to talk about the ten lost tribes of Israel. They like to think, well, gee, there's Benjamin and Jude in the south and all the rest up there. Except they ignore a few things. Where is Simeon? He wasn't up there. He's in the south. And by the way, where are the Levites? They all moved to the south. So first of all, if you've got ten tribes, you've lost one of your ten that you've lost. There's only nine that are lost, right? Because there's four in the south. I found them. Guess where I found them? In the Bible. So you gotta, that's part of the whole problem with the ten, the ten tribe myths that go around. It's interesting, though, that Simeon, Moses pronounces no blessing. And in, 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 in you go through the Deuteronomy account, you won't find Simeon. He's, he's, he's not mentioned. But they didn't lose their identity, by the way. There were cert, uh, 13 Simeonite princes in the days of Hezekiah in First Chronicles 4. So they didn't disappear. But Moses uh, just didn't, uh, at least we don't, we don't have any record of him commenting on Simeon. Now we get to the, the main one, in a sense, for Jacob. He gets to Judah. And this is a lo the longest one of the series, I believe, for, for um, Jacob in Genesis. Judah, thou art he whom my, thy brethren shall praise. There's a pun here because the word Judah means praise. All through these things, there's Hebrew wordplay, and I don't want to take the whole time waiting through that for you, but you should understand much, much of what's going on behind the scenes here is wordplay. But anyway, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's um, children shall bow down before thee. Thy father's children, your brothers, are going to bow down to you, in effect, what he's saying. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art grown up. He stooped down and he couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Then you get to this verse. And of all the verses in this chapter, you may want to hang on to this one. Verse 10. Because it's a prophecy about Judah you'll want to embrace. Jacob says to Judah, thy, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, this word scepter refers, of course, to their tribal identity and their right to apply the Mosaic laws, and included in that is the right to administer capital punishment. That's the way you can tell whether you're in charge or not. Do, do your governors and so forth have the authority to administer capital punishment? If they have to go to some king, that's a, that's a, a testimony of the fact you're subject to somebody else. See, the, the capital punishment was sort of a, 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 a bellwether here, a lit, litmus test as to whether you're sovereign or not. So that's what the scepter really turns out to mean. The word Shiloh technically means to whom it belongs, but it was recognized by the early rabbis and the Talmudic scholars as referring to the Messiah. It's a messianic term. The Targum Ankelos, the Targum uh, Suda Jonathan, the Targum Yeshur Lami, the Jerusalem Targum, um, all of them uh, uh, agree. Uh, this is a messianic uh, uh, verse. Now, what makes this thing um, uh, particularly provocative is to understand what actually happened in history. Because Herod the Great died about 4 BC. There's some ambiguity there but among some scholars. Among his sons, Herod Antipater was murdered. In fact, along with most of the family. In fact, the quip that went around, it was safer to be a dog in Herod's household than a member of the family because he murdered all his possible rivals. But the one that was left was Herod Archelaus. And he was appointed ethnarch by, uh, ethnarch by the uh, Caesar Augustus. But he was never accepted. He got bad news. So he was dethroned and banished between 6 and 7 AD. And Rome appointed a procurator. This is where that started. 
Caponius was appointed procurator. And by the way, this transfer of power is documented in Josephus in, in, in several places, in Antiquities and also in War on the Jews, both, both of his major works. The point I want to make here is the priests at that time, it's recorded in the Jerusalem Talmud and elsewhere, they felt when Caponius was appointed procurator, they recognized that the scepter had departed from Judah because they, there's a whole bunch of instances that occurred, but clearly Capon, uh, Caponius administered the Roman uh, law that only he had the power to administer the death penalty. You saw that in effect in the Passion with Christ, that they had, as vicious as those priests were, and they might unlawfully stone somebody, they, that was all against the law, they had to go to the Romans to get permission for the execution. And that's what that, that, that's what that was all about. But the point is, the high priests were so upset because they actually believed that the word of God had failed, had been broken. The priests put on sackcloth and ashes and marched around the city of Jerusalem, weeping, Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed from Judah, and the Messiah has not come. I mention that because it's, historic, it's a matter of historical record in several places. But it's interesting that it also tells you what they believed that verse meant, that it was messianic, and the idea was that the scepter would not depart from Judah until the Messiah would make his appearance. This was in 7 AD. What they didn't know is there was a young boy in a carpenter shop that his dad owned up in Nazareth. Jesus was probably at this time about nine years old. He had come. And by the way, so no one recognized him. Yes, they did. Simeon did and Anna did, remember? So it's interesting that the priests recognized the validity of the verse, and yet they actually thought that the word of God has... Can you imagine how that would shatter them, to believe that, rather than look around and say, gee, maybe we've overlooked one. Huh? Well, uh, Jacob continues with, on Judas. He's binding his foal to the vine and his ass is colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be bred with, wi bred with wine and his teeth white as milk. What, this sounds strange to our ears, but what it really is is poetic language to describe how wonderful it's going to be when Judah is, when the Messiah is reigning. The... the Wine fields will be so common you can tie a, you can use them as a as a halt as a place to type your horses. In other words, it's, it, it, the, the, that which is treasured now will be just casual, is what that's really implied there. They use this, they'll use uh, uh, vines as hitching posts. Uh, wine will be as abundant as washing water. Doesn't mean they'll actually wash their clothes in wine. Is what they, they tend to say is it'll be as available uh, as 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 uh, wine will be uh, you know, uh, as available as water. And people's eyes be red. You and I tend to think of that as meaning that they are stoned all the time. That's not what it means. It means they'll be sparkling. It's the word is similar to meaning. It also means bright. Their eyes will be bright. And uh, uh, so these are, and their teeth will be white from drinking. It's a, a poet's way of expressing that the, the, the delicacies will be readily available and it's going to be just a, a time of abundance is, is, is what's really being communicated here. However, be alert. It is interesting, in another, that's what I believe Jacob was communicating, a, mess, a, a millennial kind of blessing here. But it's interesting to realize that your vestments and mine are washed in his blood. So you can carry that typology a little further if you want to. In Deuteronomy, Moses' equivalent thing, he said, this is the blessing of Judah, and he said, hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people, let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou a help to him from his enemies, and indeed God was. So Judah means praise, the root means to praise. He intercedes for Joseph's life when the brethren are about to kill him, and he's the one that proposed the sale to the Ishmaelites as a way of keeping him alive, see? He, of course, he had this tawdry, horrible thing in, in, in Genesis 38, the incest with Tamar, but he was tricked into that. He was loyal to the house of David at a very critical time when the revolt of the ten tribes occurred. Judah was loyal to uh, David. And uh, he led the first division of Israel on their journeys, commissioned of God to lead the conquest of the promised land. And uh, he, it was the tribe of Judah that made David king in 2 Samuel 2. 
Let's move on to the next one. Zebulun shall dwell in the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zion, is what Jacob said. His border shall be unto Zion. And uh, of Zebulun, he said, uh, this is Moses now, uh, Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, thy going out, and Issachar, in thy tents, they shall call the people out of the mountain, for they shall offer sacrifice of righteousness, for they shall, they shall suck of the abundance of the seas out of the treasures hid in the sand. Now, by the way, I was very disappointed. I was trying to dig into the commentaries. What does this treasures in the sand refer to? And I can't find anyone that makes a reference to it. So there's two possibilities that pop into my mind. I have no basis for this. An oil man might say, maybe that's a hint that there's oil in that region. But there have been oil men in Israel. With all, you hear all these stories where they're hoping to get oil. So far, I haven't heard of any significant, any really significant finds. But the other thing that occurs to us in this century, if you'd want to talk about silica, it's interesting that in the Middle East, Israel is the Silicon Valley. Intel has plants there. Uh, uh, the, the technology reach of Israel is substantial. And so I can, I could, but not, not with any confidence, suggest that this is a hint of that. But uh, Zebulun shall dwell in the haven of the sea, he says. Well, it turns out that in Galilee, to the north of Issachar and to the south of Asher and Naphtali, and between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean is where they abide. And that was a very rich area, and that's because they were between the Phoenicians, which are doing all the sea trade, and they're also between Galilee, which was a key point. So the, this part of Galilee uh, enjoyed also a, a large part of the Lord's ministry, obviously, because that's where he did most of his work, up in the Galilee, not down in Jerusalem. And that's all emphasized in Isaiah 9, as well as Matthew 4 and elsewhere. But Issachar, yeah, Jacob says, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. This is in the King James. I'll come back to that. And he saw the rest was good and that the land, was, it was pleasant. And he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Um, the word hamor garem in the, uh, in the Hebrew actually refers to a bony ass. And what it refers to, uh, it's not a derogatory term, what it's referring to is the kind of animal, not a wild animal that was fast on its feet, but rather a very powerful beast that's very submissive to his master to get work done in exchange for being, being at peace to lie under the trees when not working. That's sort of the image that's portrayed here. And uh, Issachar, uh, located in the fertile part of the country, uh, and uh, they would submit to the Canaanite uh, uh, invaders, and uh, instead of fighting, they would, the men would uh, uh, submissively allow themselves to become slaves of the invaders. And uh, they would prefer the shame of slavery to the challenge of courageous action. So that may be <coughs> what's been embodied in here. So the ninth son by Leah, and... Uh, Remember, it was the, the word really suggests my hire because of the mandrakes thing that Leah dealt with. And uh, this prophetic blessing that uh, Jacob corresponds to the one that Moses echoes later. It's interesting, though, only Judah and Dan are stronger than this one because their 64,000 went to 87,000 by, by the time you get to First Chronicles. So they, they are a strengthening tribe even though they're, they're submissive. They got the richest portion of all the tribes, the Jezreel Valley. At least that's the way it is today. Now we get to Dan. Here's a mystery one. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. That's what the word Dan means, his judge. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way. The word there is nachash. Same word as used in Genesis 3. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider will fall backward. And uh, in the Hebrew, the adder is actually an arrow snake, but it's a good thing. I have waited for that. And then, and then, and then uh, Jacob inserts here a little salutation. It may or may not have anything to do with Dan. He says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. That may be just a, 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 you know, a divider of some kind. But um, when you get to Moses, he, says, and he said, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now, Bashan is the Golan Heights area, but it also... The, be, that was a cattle country, and the bulls of Bashan were legendary. But it was also the region of Og, the king of the giants. So the word Bashan carries connotations of evil. So, but uh, 
And Dan was the first to fall in idolatry. And that's what most people believe that means about biting the horse, that rider falls backwards. Now he's, 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 not, he's not helping, he's causing uh, problems. And uh, Judges 18, they're the first tribe to introduce, introduce uh, uh, genealogy. You'll notice, not only are they omitted in the sealing of the 12 tribes in Je Revelation 7, that's where it gets always, it's always because, where's Dan? Dan's not there, he's not sealed. But you'll also notice if you study all the genealogies, the names of Dan's sons are omitted. In, uh, in uh, Genesis 46, we encountered it, and also in Numbers uh, 26, there's a genealogy of all the 12 tribes. They're in their sons and sons and sons. When you get to Dan, it, there's the word Hushim. It, it's, it's a, it's a, his name seems to be blotted out. In fact, it's literally blotted out in the, in the genealogy of 1 Chronicles uh, 1 uh, through 10 and in Revelation 7. He's mentioned last when he is mentioned in Numbers 10 and Joshua 19 and 1 Chronicles 27 and so forth. Now, uh, one thing, what I, the, the thing that strikes me as I study the scripture, I almost get the feeling that the Holy Spirit had a problem with Dan all the way through the text because he apparently knew what was going to happen. Because you have to give him, you know, the Holy Spirit credit. He would know the end from the beginning. He's God. But the fact that Dan was the mechanism by which adultery in the land is part of, the, part of what's being laid out here. Um, when you get to the name, uh, uh, when, when his sons are omitted, but they'll, you won't notice in your English Bible because you'll see the word hushim or shusham, which are words meaning pit diggers. It's an epithet rather than their names, you see. So it's a... Uh, we get to the next one, Gad. Now this one's complicated because there are six Hebrew words in verse 19 that play on the name Gad in the Hebrew, which uh, word actually means attack. Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at last. There's some real translation challenges here. Gad will be attacked by a group of attackers, but he will attack. And the word Gadad means to break into or attack. And so border raids were often experienced by the tribes that settled east of the Jordan. He was one of the ones, Reuben, Gad, half-tribe Manasseh, picked the east. And that turned out to be a bad choice from the point of view of, uh, of their exterior enemies. That's true today with the Golan Heights and all of that. And of Gad, he said, uh, this is Moses now, of Gad, he said, Blessed be the, uh, he that enlargeth Gad, he dwelleth as a lion, he teareth the arm with the crown of the head. He provided the first part for himself, because there in a portion of the lawgiver, there was he seated, he came with the heads of the people, he executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments of Israel. So Gad is Jacob's seventh son by Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, brother of Asher, which means fortune and luck. I mean, uh, Asher does. The tribe was fierce and warlike. And uh, it's interesting that in 1 Chronicles 12, they were the strong men of might, men of war for battle. They could handle the shield and buckler, and they had their faces like lions, and they and rose upon the mountains of wilderness. swiftness is the way it's recorded there. So that seems to be a fulfillment of the predictions that you find in the Torah. Elijah, by the way, was of this tribe. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Asher's area would be fertile and productive, providing rich food. The, the tribe settled along the rich northern coast of Canaan. And uh, so that was uh, good, uh, good ground. Moses said of Asher, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass as thy days. So shall thy strength be. So Asher, his bread shall be fat and so forth. He settled, I say, in the northern part, Mount Lebanon to the Mediterranean, inclusive. Royal dainties could re be referring to workmen and materials, which, of course, were provided from that region for the temple and so on, to David and to Solomon, 2 Samuel 5 and 1 Kings 5. And he also he kept the Passover under Hezekiah in contrast to the others. In other words, Asher was demonstrated faithfulness to the Mosaic uh, priesthood. And by the way, it, to this tribe belong the prophetess Anna, which occurs in Luke 2. There's a member of the ten tribes that wasn't lost. She was there, very conspicuous, in Luke chapter 2. Let's go to Naphtali. Is a hind let loose? He giveth goodly words. And uh, Moses said of Naphtali, O Naphtali, be satisfied with favor, so full of the blessing of the Lord. Possess thou the west and the south. Well, Naphtali is the fifth son of Jacob, second born uh, to him by Rachel's handmaid Bilhah. And he was the full brother of, of course, Dan. And uh, 
at birth, Rachel is said to have exclaimed the wrestlings of God, mighty wrestlings, with who have I wrestled. So you can, that's what, so Naphtali is like a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. North and northwest of the Sea of Galilee is where he's, and that's where Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin lie. And, and that, of course, has conspicuous meanings in the New Testament period. Get to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well. That's good news. You know, that's, that's, that's the third concept of riches. Whose branches run over the wall. And the word branches actually in the Hebrew is daughters. But the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. And some other titles he's going to add to this. So uh, he certainly is, uh, this is a prediction of prosperity. He, uh, Jacob is lavishing more on Jacob than all the others. The fruitfulness, of course, is an echo of the name of Ephraim in the first place, which means fruitful. And so there's a promise of victory and prosperity buried in this language. And, uh, of course, the victory in battle was experienced by Joshua, Deborah, Samuel, and the whole tribe of Ephraim, by Gideon, Jephthah, both of them from Manasseh's tribe. So there's a whole history you can bring to bear in, in, in this. It, Jacob continues, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, El Shaddai, in other words, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of thy progenitors and to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brethren. This, of course, is the proud father echoing the joy of this reunion that he's just experienced before dying uh, in Egypt. And of Joseph, he said, this is Moses now. And he, of Joseph, he said, Blessed the Lord be his land, the precious things of heaven for the dew and for the deep that coucheth beneath and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun and for the precious things put forth by the moon and for the chief things of the ancient mountains <clears throat> and for the precious things of the lasting hills and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. So again, echoing pretty much Jacob's thing. His glory is like the firstling of the bullock and the horns like the horns of the unicorns. With him he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Again, see Ephraim's the dominant of the two tribes, the younger one. Well, Joseph, of course, means may he, God, add, it means adding, adding his sons and indeed he brought two, son, two extra brothers into the family, so to speak. He first born of Rachel, the, the loved wife. He was favored, then despised, then sold, and finally exalted. And uh, there are over a hundred ways can be listed that uh, he was a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Now, some of that hundred that Arthur W. Pink uh, has, and we have in, we have in our uh, uh, appended to our notes, are uh, you say I was reaching a bit, but still it's pretty interesting. Ephraim is the second son of Joseph, of course, adopted by Jacob, put before Manasseh, the firstborn. He was the leading tribe of the northern kingdom. They called himself of Israel, house of Israel. Um, and uh, Manasseh, which means forgetfulness, first son of Joseph. And uh, he, of course, was also adopted by Jacob, but second to Ephraim. And Manasseh's uh, tribe was known for its valor. Gideon in the west and Jephthah in the east are very prominent in the book of Judges, chapter 6 and 11. And the, their inheritance was split. They're the one that split. They straddled the Jordan. Half tribe east of the Jordan, half tribe west of the Jordan. Numbers 32 and Joshua 16. Get to Benjamin. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. The old English word raven means to prey with rapacity. And it speaks of fierce cruelty. And Benjamin sure was. You remember what he did to the concubine there in the book of Judges. And uh, so, the, uh, so it's a, here's a tribe with a violent spirit, uh, very, very good warriors. Um, it's interesting that Saul was a Benjamite, as was Jonathan, incidentally. Um, so and, and Moses says of Benjamin, he said, Beloved of the Lord shall dwell in the safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. It's interesting that the area of Benjamin is very small, but it is the part that Jerusalem sits in. It, the boundary there is the Teropian Valley because uh, the, the Mount Zion is used collectively for the whole area. But technically, Mount, you've got Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, 
Mount Zion, and south of them, of course, is the, uh, the Hinnom Valley. But the point is, the part that is Mount Zion technically is not in, is not in Judah, it's in Benjamin. So he literally, his, his portion is between the shoulders, topologically. And, uh, so the, uh, and uh, Mount Moriah, which of course is the sacred edifice, uh, lay actually in the confines of Benjamin. So he's the youngest son of Joseph, called the son of my right hand by his father. He renamed him. Um, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, of course, 49 says. He was known as ferocious in 2 Samuel 2, 1 Chronicles 8, and several other places. And his notable heroes from this tribe, even as a, bear in mind, it was a very, very, a tribe so small they had to muster daughters to keep it alive in the end of the book of Judges. But they sure spawned a number of heroes. Ehud, who delivered the Israel from the Moabites in the book of Judges. Saul, the first king, and also his son Jonathan, obviously, are from Benjamin. Queen Esther is from Benjamin. And, of course, the apostle Paul is, is uh, uh, a Benjamite. And so these are, this is a distinguished group. They have a, earned a reputation for bravery and skill in war. And uh, they're noted for their slingers with their left hand and all that business that we went through in Judges 3. So, um, so that wraps it up. It, it, Jacob says, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite in a cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession of the burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah's wife, and there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. And we read chapter 50, the burial and all that, last time. So uh, a couple of things. That these tribes are listed 20 times in the scripture. I thought I'd go through each one in detail. No, relax, I'm kidding. But they're, they're, they are listed in Genesis, the natural order, the entering Egypt. And then here we just went through the prophetic blessing. They are listed when entering Egypt with Joseph omitted being, already being in Egypt. In Numbers, we have the leaders with Levi omitted. We have the first census, Levi omitted. Then we have the order of the camp. And I'm going to come back to that here in a minute because there's some surprises in that. And um, the order of the camp was given three times in uh, 2, 7, 10. In the order of the offerings, order of March, the spies, second census in chapter 26, and then dividing the land in Numbers 34. Again, the eastern tribes east of the Jordan were omitted in that listing. In Deuteronomy, we have blessings and cursings. You remember that back in Deuteronomy 27? And uh, in the blessings of Moses, we had Simeon missing, by the way, interesting enough. And uh, so, and uh, the order, incidentally, in Deuteronomy was geographical. I won't press on that. In Joshua, we have the allocation of the territories in great detail in four groups to furnish the cities for four classes of priests. And then in Judges, we have the Song of Deborah. And there, Judah and Simeon are omitted because it's really happening up north. And in Chronicles, we have genealogies. Zebulon there is omitted, and Dan in verse 7, strangely. Officers under David, Gad and Asher omitted. Ezekiel, we have the kingdom divisions in the millennium listed. In Revelation, we have them listed again. In Revelation 7, with Dan very conspicuously omitted, very profound. The 12 tribes, and we had the names. I won't go through them all again just to refresh your memory, though. I want to talk about that a little bit. If you take Revelation 7, and see, they're listed in this particular order, which is a strange order in some ways. It's not chronological, and it's not by mothers. It's a strange order. Not only is Dan missing, but it's, and you'll notice in this order there, there are two tribes that are missing. Can you spot the two tribes that are missing? In Everybody knows Dan is missing. That's well known. There's another tribe missing, at least not named. Can you find the tribe that is not named here? I can't hear you. Who? Ephraim. Very good. I couldn't hear you. Good. Yes, exactly. See, Manasseh is dealt with, when you get down here next to the last, is Joseph. Well, if you already dealt with, with uh, Manasseh, well, who's left? Ephraim. Well, why did the Holy Spirit label it Ephraim? Because Ephraim was one of the two tribes that idolatry entered the land. Remember under Jeroboam? Uh, he becomes very conspicuous. That's where the golden calves and all that were reestablished. But if you take the names of these, Judah means praise the Lord. Reub means that he has looked upon my affliction. Gad says granted good fortune. Asher's happy am I. Naphtali speaks of my wrestling. 
Manasseh means he made me forget my sorrow. These are quotes from the fathers and mothers. Simeon, God hears me. Levi, God has joined me. Issachar has purchased me. Zebulun, he's exalted me. Joseph, he's added to me. Benjamin, the son of his right hand. Right? Remember those names? Well, let's read them. Praise the Lord. He has looked upon my affliction and granted good fortune. Happy am I. My wrestling has made me forget my sorrow. God hears me, has joined me, purchased me, exalted me, adding to me the son of his right hand. Now, what you can, you know, you say, gee, Chuck, you're kind of contriving something. Not really. That's what these things are quoted out of the scripture. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's a praise anthem. What you can do if you're in the mood sometime is take the names, recognizing some slight variations in each one, and t there's, there's, there are, you know, a number of others to look, take a look at. It may or may not make sense. I leave it to you to play with. If you, it, your beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Huh? The camp of Israel. I, I got over that. You know, it's interesting. You get to Numbers chapter 2. This is one of those chapters you want to skip. You always want to be careful when you're going to skip a chapter. Every detail, I argue, is in the scripture by deliberate design. And when you find something you don't understand, you should ask yourself, what might be hidden behind the details? In this case, the camp of Israel. Remember, Jesus said in Psalm 40, the volume of the book is written of me. Wait, that's Psalm. Jesus said that? Yes, that Hebrews 10, 7 contributes it to him. So the camp of Israel, you go through Numbers 2, you find out, you tediously go through the camp of Israel. Now notice these numbers are the census, but they're only the men able to go to war. So women and children, old men, young men are not counted. Only the men able to go to war. And so you need to take these numbers as representative. There's some ratio. If every guy has a wife and maybe one child, you have to multiply these by 3 or 2.8 or some number. You with me? But these are, you, you, you understand what I'm saying here? Okay. So you discover Judah has 74, 600 and Issachar 54.4 and Zebulun 57.4. You go through these numbers. Say, gee, that's exciting, Chuck. What am I supposed to see there? Bear with me. Um, before, we need to know something else about the camp of Israel. Do you remember we went through the signs in the heavens? Remember we had the different sides that we called the zodiac in the pagan world? And they call it, the, the, you know, the, we, we have a thing called, they call it the Matzeroth. Remember we looked at that in Genesis. And the Matzeroth, all the stars have a name, the scripture tells us, both in the Psalms and Isaiah. The word zodiac, by the way, comes from the word sodi, the, which means the way. If you look in the book of Acts, before they were called Christians, the, the, God's, it was called the way, remember? It's interesting. Most of our insights of the ancient uh, 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 ecliptics and so forth is from the Temple of Dendera, 2000 BC. And there actually is such a place, and we have copies of, the, of, of the, the, what we call the zodiac. And there's an, not only are there 12 signs of the zodiac, each sign has several associated with it. The first is Virgo, the virgin. It has the coma, the Centaurus, and Buddhist. And I'm not going to go through these again in detail, but just as by way of refreshing what we went through. Libra, yeah, I'm using the pagan names here because that's what the astronomers use for geographical, you know, for positioning. Now don't, don't, don't accuse me of astrology. That's a whole other nightmare. Um, Libra, uh, the concept of Libra is, has associated with it the cross, lupus or victim, pierced to death, and the crown of the crown. And the Scorpio has the, serp has the serpent, Orphicus, wrestling with the serpent, and Hercules, the mighty man. These are, all, these are the labels of the constellations associated with each of the major constellations by the, the vestiges of the mythology that has come since the Babylonian captivity. All this gets corrupted in Babylon. It had different labels earlier. Sagittarius had Lyra the eagle with the lyre, Hera the altar, Draco the dragon. And uh, we'll, you know, we, we, we go through all of these, but you end up, of course, ultimately um, with... I don't have to go through each one of these because I don't want to run this too long. But uh, you finally get this all builds up to, of course, Leo the lion. And uh, where we have uh, the cup of wrath and, of course, the, the bird of doom and so forth. Now, let's just take one to show you what we see. The trick, you don't see these pictures in the sky. Every planetarium show is wrong. The stars were not that different in arrangement that far ago. They were a little bit different, but not that different. They were about 60 degrees different on the ecliptic because of calendar issues. But they were still in the same visible arrangement. They didn't see a woman there. The woman has a branch in one hand and an ear of corn in the other. This is Virgo the Virgin, as it's called. What you need to do is learn the names of the stars in the order of brightness in the constellation. They tell a story. 
the brightest star is Alpha, uh, Alpha, which always called Alpha, is Spica, which means an ear of corn. In the Hebrew, it's Semek. In Arabic, it's al Semak, and in Egypt, it's Aspolia, all, which means seed. There are 20 Hebrew words that can be translated branch, but Semek is, the, is used exclusively of the Messiah as the branch. How interesting. Is that good? And, uh, anyway, we'll go through all of it here. This is a, so I'm going to see, the promised seed of the woman with a branch in her right hand and ears of corn. Why ears of corn? Because except a corn die, and so forth. You know the story. Jesus explains that to you in John 12. Libra, let's just take one more, the branches. Hebrew word is manzanim, which means the scales or weighing. In Arabic, it's al-zubina, which is purchase or redemption. In the Coptic, it's lambadia, which means the station of propitiation. In Latin, Libra means weighing is what it means. Alpha, the brightest star, is zubin aganubi, the price deficient. And the, beta, the next one is the price which covers. So you see, our price is, we're, we, we're deficient, but God has paid the one that covers. So this, the, the, the next one is the price of conflict. And this leads towards Centaurus and the victim slain, the deacons. And I won't go through all of these here. This is all by way of review. The point is, as you try to pierce through the corruption of the names and the fighting with the serpents, you finally get to Leo the lion, who's the hero of the whole piece. Lion of the tribe of Judah. And uh, in, in Hebrew, it's Ari, the lion. It's uh, associated with the tribe of Judah. This by the star is Regulus, which means treading underfoot. And uh, Denebola, which is the judge cometh. Denebola all said, the judge shall reign. The deacons are Hydra, the fleeing serpent, creator of the cup of fire, and the cover. Now, here's the point. If you go through these, Virgo speaks of the seed of the woman, the desire of nations, the man with a double nature and humiliation, and the exalted shepherd and the harvester. These are all embodied in in. Virgo and the associated deacons. Under Libra, you've got the price to be paid, the cross that endured, the victim slain, and the crown that was purchased in those constellations. Scorpio, you've got the conflict, the serpent's coils, the struggle with the enemy, and the toiling vanquisher of evil. Inside what we call Sagittarius is the double-natured one triumphing, the double-natured one triumphing, and they have discovered the key star is a double star. That's a recent discovery. He gladdens the heavens, and he builds fires of punishment. He cast down the dragon. Capricornus is actually life out of death, the arrow of God, pierced and failing, spring up again in abundant life. Aquarius is a man pouring water, life waters from on high, drinking the heavenly food, carrying the good news, bearing the cross over the earth. Pisces, multiplication of the Redeemer's people, upheld and governed by the land, intended bride bound and exposed, bridegroom exalted. Aries, the lamb found worthy, the bride released and making ready, Satan bound, the breaker triumphing. There are a handful of books that have, uh, Bullinger, Seiss, there's four or five classic studies that bring, will bring this out if you want to dig into it. We have a briefing called the Signs in Heavens that goes through parts of this. But anyway, the invisible ruler come, the sublime vanquisher, the river of judgment, the all-ruling shepherd, and the marriage of the lamb, the enemy trodden down, prince coming in glory, princely falling. You won't find these in any astrology book because they're all dealing with the mythology after Babylon. Cancer of the possession secured, lesser fold of the church of the firstborn, the greater fold of Israel. Safe folding into the everlasting kingdom. And then we have Leo, the king rendering, serpent fleeing, the bowl of wrath upon him, his carcass devoured. Signs in the heavens, we, we have a briefing on this. Now, here's what I want to get to. So, there are 12 signs. And uh, Virgo, Libra, there's, there they are. This is not the order you normally see. Most people start at Aries. Aries, by the way, is, was the ancient word for Mars because that's where the Mars pass bys happen, but that's a whole other thing. These are starting with the virgin birth, ending with Leo. You can, it's a circle. You can start wherever you like. But that's what the Sphinx points to, with the head of a lion and the uh, head of a woman and the body of a lion. Anyway, so we have the names of the tribes that are associated with each of these. Um, we notice something right away, of course, that, uh, by the way, uh, Scorpio, Abraham called it, the, he used the term the eagle, referring to that. But we know that in Numbers 2, these Zebulun, Iskar, and Judah were to be a camp of Judah. And... Uh, the Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim were to be the camp of Ephraim. And Gad, Simeon, and Reuben was to be the camp of Reuben. And Naphtali, Asher, and Dan were the camp of Dan. You with me so far? And each one of these had an emblem on their thing reflecting the sign that was associated with them. Dan was the eagle, Reuben the man, Ephraim the ox, and Judah the lion. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now let's come back. Oh, and by the way, they're to camp north, south, west, and east. Dan to the north, Reuben to the south, Ephraim to the west, and Judah, of course, to the east. So now we take these numbers that were so mysterious. Let's add them up to find out how big those camps are. Well, Judah is 186,000 on round numbers. 
and uh, uh, Ephraim's at 108,000. Reuben and Dan are both about 150 and change, huh? Well, we got a problem. Let's lay out this camp and re let's realize how diligent the rabbis tried to be following the law. We sometimes smile that they seem to split hairs, but give them credit, they're trying to do exactly what they were told to do. Well, what in the center of the camp, of course, was the tabernacle, and the space around the tabernacle, and it was set so the opening of the tabernacle was to the east. So on our charts, we have, you know, the north to the top. In, in, in biblical charts, you always, or, you, or in most religious charts, whatever temples you're talking about, typically face towards the, the sunrise. So it's east is the, is the designated. And certainly in this case, that's what the Bible calls for. So the opening of the, the camp was to the, uh, on the eastern side. Moses and the priests were on the east side of the tabernacle, and the Kohathites, Gershonites, and Merites were on the southwest and north side of the tabernacle, each with their own specific duties as, as Levites. Moses and the priests on the one side, and the three families of the Levites on the other three sides. Now, they had, uh, they had by the way, I forget the number, I think something like 20, in the numbers we're talking about, they had about 22,000 in the, in, the, in the listing. So what, I don't know how much space they needed. You can imagine how many people there were, add for wives, whatever, and then figure out how many square footage you expect for a tent. Whatever that is, that's going to be our unit. We're going to make that our unit. That's, that's, the, that's the area of the Levites. Okay. Now, the rabbis they said, were told that their Judah was supposed to be on, uh, to the east of the Levites. No problem. Camp of Reuben was to be the south of the Levites. No problem. That means, though, to be strict, you can't be southwest. Because if you're southwest, you're neither south nor west. You follow me? Think how like a rabbi would. So only the cardinal directions are ordained. Okay? And only the width of Levite's camp is implied. See, in other words, and what we'll do, we're going to make the length of the thing will be a proportional to the population. So here we have the camp of the Levites. Gershonites was 7,500, Kohathites 8,600, Merarites 6,200. Total for about 22,300 plus wives, whatever. But that, that's our unit. Whatever that is, is it 100 feet on a side? Is it 100 yards on a side? I couldn't care. That's our unit. You with me? Now, if I'm Judah, I have to camp to the east. So I can camp as wide as they are, because I'm still east of the camp, of, of, of the Levites, right? But I can't go wider. Okay. Now, if I'm Reuben, I have to be on the south side. My tribal standard is a man, and the other three, you know, the other tribes, they all rally around my standard, and we set up our camp to the south of the Levites. But I can't go beyond the width of their camp because if I want to put a tent down here, say in the southeast, I got a problem because that's southeast. It's neither south nor east. Can you think like a rabbi here? You're going to be do what it says to do. Okay, Reuben, you have to stay on the South side, okay? So southeast, southwest, northwest, northeast are places that are verboten. You can use that for something else. You can't camp there. So I don't know, maybe you, play, you, know, you can you know, play a game of um, softball or whatever, fine. But anyway, so Ephraim camps to the west, Dan to the, to the uh, north, right? Now, each one of these will take whatever length it needs to proportional to their, to their population, so let's make this to scale, and let's, uh, what I usually like to do is I pretend we're going to go outside, and I got a special helicopter waiting, and this helicopter is very unique because it not only can carry us all the way to the Holy Land, it also, it's a time machine, and we can crank it back to see what the camp looked like from the air as we approach, and we're going to approach the camp from the east, naturally, and we're going to see, you know, uh, uh, an interesting thing. Now, uh, Judah was 186,000, 150, 150, okay, there we are. So if we develop that to scale, that's what the camp of Israel like, would look like from the air. What does that look like to you? A cross. How fascinating. Yeah, because, the, see, the east and west, the, the east is the longest, the west is the shortest, and the other two are nominally the same length. And that's fascinating. When you apply that diligence to this, you've got a sketch from the air in Numbers 2 of the camp of Israel. I could phrase it another way, too. This is probably something like that Balaam saw from the hills in the book of Numbers when he was called upon by Balak to curse the land and so forth. It's also interesting 
that the four tribal standards, the ox, the eagle, the man, and the lion, are also echoing our ears from some other reasons too, because those are the four faces of the cherubim in the Bible. They also profile the four Gospels. And uh, I'll let you sort that out um, on your own, but it's very clear the four Gospels each present a very specific perception of Jesus Christ. And uh, Matthew is Jewish. He presents him as a lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's very oriented to that. Uh, Mark is not interested in pedigree. He's a, he, pre preaches, he presents Jesus Christ as the suffering, obedient servant. And it's the only, it's the only gospel without the genealogy in it. Luke is a doctor. He's interested in Christ's humanity. He starts his genealogy from Adam and so forth. And, and uh, uh, he, man is, and of course, uh, the last gospel, the gospel of John, which presents the deity of Jesus Christ. And it has a genealogy too, the first three verses. So that is our conclusion of our book of Genesis, the 12 tribes. Isn't that fun? Yeah. So, so I encourage you, uh, as you go through your Bible, every time you find something that seems boring or contradictory or so forth, well, don't, de don't get derailed on these side trips. But on the other hand, make a note to yourself when you get in the mood, dig it out. Because God will always reward the diligent. And don't be surprised if he brings to you some discoveries. I'll tell you where it'll happen. It'll happen with your involvement in a small home study group. It generally will not happen to you as a, in a spectator sport called Sunday morning church. I'm not saying you shouldn't go Sunday morning church. Don't misunderstand me. But where this happens is when you're engaging in a small group, sharing insights and, and, and going at, the, at, the, uh, at a book of the Bible exegetically uh, and expositionally. And uh, the Lord will bring insights into that group that no one brought into the room. And when you see that happen, it just, it's nothing like it. Very exciting. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. I hope the Genesis series has been fruitful for you, and uh, I encourage you to go back through it again with your notes, and every time you go through, you'll make a, a new discovery. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for this fabulous book of Genesis. We thank you, for you alone were there when the universe was created. We thank you for this record. We thank you, Father, that you've in, intruded yourself into all the goings here to execute your plan to redeem us. We thank you, Father, that you have loved us so much to go to such extremes that we might have access to something that we could never earn on our own. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your word becoming incarnate and dwelling among us and enduring the cross. We thank you, Father, for that achievement on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit to open these scriptures to our lives. Father, we would ask that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you would help each of us to continue to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and that you would help each of us become more fruitful stewards of these treasures that you've provided us that we might be more pleasing in thy sight as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.